Welcome to the Honeywell RDR 4000 interview weather radar pilot familiarization for Boeing aircraft, including the new hazard version 3 display features. This training is broken into modules. These modules will build upon each other, providing a basis for understanding and using the RDR 4000 system. The modules should be viewed in order. We'll start with a brief introduction, comparing the RDR 4000 to conventional radar. Look at the heart of the system, the 3D volumetric buffer, and the operational modes it provides, including predictive wind shear. We'll then look at the hazard display features and how to determine the options installed on your aircraft. At the end, we'll pull it all together by showing some operational examples and review some in-service experience. So let's begin. The RDR 4000 is much easier to use, but it's different. It automates many of the tasks required by conventional radar but does them in a different way. So a good starting point would be a quick review of conventional tilt-based radar operation, and then we'll see how the RDR 4000 makes life easier. With a conventional tilt-based radar, the system sweeps an area ahead of the aircraft based on the selected tilt angle. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the antenna sweep and what is shown on the display. It provides reflectivity information in two dimensions, azimuth and range. For detection, most crews use a technique called the cruise ground park technique, or it could be referred to as establishing a protection zone. Whatever it's called, the technique is the same, lowering the beam until ground returns appear at the outer edge of the display. The technique has two main benefits. First, storm cells are easily identified because they walk out of the ground returns. And secondly, if there isn't a radar shadow behind the cell, then we know the radar signal hasn't been attenuated. This technique detects all cells, but analysis is still required in order to make a deviation decision. Radar does not directly measure rainfall rate. It measures how much of the transmitted energy is reflected back to the radar. The amount of reflected energy is proportional to the rainfall rate and is represented by the different colors on the display. For analysis, we manipulate the tilt control and observe the colors on the display. But why do we look at the colors? Based on studies, we know that with higher reflectivity comes higher probabilities of turbulence and hail size. Both good reasons to detect the maximum reflectivity and look at the colors. If we enter the turbulence probability chart at the beginning of the red color, we could say that we have a 40% chance of moderate turbulence and a 5% chance of severe turbulence. Another way to say it would be that we have a 60% chance of encountering less than moderate turbulence and a 95% chance of experience less than severe turbulence. These are probabilities, however, and unfortunately the relationship between reflectivity and turbulence is not as direct as we would like, and so we must use other methods to assess the threat. Also note that the chart only applies to convective weather, so we must first determine if we are dealing with convective or stratiform weather first. The area of maximum reflectivity, or bright band, exists about the freezing level. This is a very dynamic area in the cell where water changes state from liquid to solid, creating very high reflectivity and the release of latent heat or energy that causes cells to build. This area also contains icing, lightning, hail, and turbulence. Think of a small garden fountain and a much larger fountain at a nearby park. The lifting force required for the larger fountain is like the vertical development in a strong cell. These stronger updrafts also cause strong downdrafts and turbulence. During our analysis, we need to determine if the cell is like our little garden fountain or the more powerful fountain in the park. For our analysis, we want to look at several things. We've observed the maximum reflectivity, but we also want to look at how much reflectivity there is above the freezing level. We're looking at two items. First, where the higher reflectivity ends, yellow and red, and where the wet top ends, green. The higher these areas extend above the freezing level, the more dangerous they are. Convective activity is detected by looking at the vertical development, or extent of cells, and how much moisture is carried aloft. So altitude is the important third dimension. Conventional radars only provide range and azimuth information. The RDR 4000 captures altitude information and uses it in the automatic detection and manual analysis modes to provide additional information to assist in making deviation decisions. 
The RDR-4000 is subject to the same physical limitations as conventional radar, but it provides modes to help reduce workload. As the description of the RDR-4000 progresses, note how altitude information is used to help the pilot make informed decisions. This module will examine the heart of the RDR-4000 system, the 3D volumetric buffer. We'll start with a quick review of what information goes into the buffer. But first, what is a buffer? A buffer is just a storage area for information. We store the information the radar collects in a memory organized in three dimensions, latitude, longitude, and altitude. For each location in the 3D buffer, we store associated information like range, reflectivity, turbulence, and if the returns came from weather or ground. The system automatically and continuously scans and collects weather and ground returns from the nose of the aircraft out to 320 nautical miles and from the ground to 60,000 feet. For scans above the freezing level, the system automatically increases the gain to make less reflective frozen storm tops more visible. The scanned information is stored in the 3D volumetric buffer and is continuously updated and compensated for aircraft movement. The data is also corrected for the Earth's curvature, so the altitudes displayed by the system are true MSL altitudes. If left uncorrected, the effect of the Earth's curvature can be quite significant. In the picture shown, the aircraft is at flight level 250. However, because of the Earth's curvature, the center of the beam is above 27,000 feet at 60 nautical miles, almost 37,000 feet at 120 nautical miles, and 44,000 feet at 150 nautical miles. The automatic scanning stores all the weather and ground return information in the 3D buffer memory. The system also contains an internal worldwide terrain database that is a version of our EGPWS database but without airports, runways, and obstacles. Because the system uses only the terrain information, regularly scheduled updates are not required. The terrain database allows the radar to distinguish between weather and ground returns, so we can then display only weather information in the weather mode and only ground returns in the ground map mode. In the ground map mode, the ground returns are provided by the radar returns and not the internal terrain database. This allows for an independent verification of position. Other information put into the 3D buffer includes enhanced turbulence data. Turbulence data is provided out to 40 or 60 nautical miles for any range selection depending on the system. The new enhanced turbulence detection provides more sensitive and accurate turbulence information with fewer false alerts and improved correlation to predicted aircraft G-forces. It is up to 12 times more sensitive than current systems. We now have a complete picture of the environment ahead of the aircraft and can analyze the information in the buffer to detect wind shear, turbulence, provide cell growth, movement and attenuation information, and to predict areas containing hail and lightning. Since there is no tilt control, the pilot is not using the control panel to control the radar, but rather using it to request information from the 3D buffer. This is what allows our system to provide pilots with independent selections of range, mode, gain, and altitude slices. This information can be presented in many ways, including comparing the buffer data to the aircraft's flight plan and displaying the weather on the flight path in solid colors as shown here, and weather outside the flight path displayed in a hash pattern as shown here. The pilot can also extract earth curvature corrected altitude slices from the buffer and display them. Here we have the same storm cell with slices extracted at 12,000 feet and 22,000 feet. This analysis mode provides a simple means for making deviation decisions. So now, let's take a peek into the 3D volumetric buffer. This is the two-dimensional plan view radar display that you normally see, but this is what's inside the 3D volumetric buffer that makes up that display. This is a snapshot in time from an actual flight. We collect and store everything providing live, continuously updated information. This 3D volumetric scan is more robust for handling varying geographic conditions and detecting hazards close to the aircraft. The returns are classified as weather or ground. 
so we can remove the ground returns, leaving just the weather, or remove the weather, just leaving the ground map. Let's peel the layers of these cells away like the layers of an onion. Removing green leaves yellow and red reflectivity along with turbulence information. Removing yellow shows the highest reflectivity red and turbulent areas. Removing the red leaves only the turbulence information. The turbulence threshold is set for moderate turbulence, but the actual values are stored in the buffer, so we can set the threshold for lower turbulence values or increase the threshold to show stronger turbulence. You can see here we are heading very close to an area of strong turbulence. You can't peel away the layers like this, but you still have some very powerful tools available for making deviation decisions. Let's put all the colors back so we can look at constant altitude slices. These have been corrected for the Earth's curvature, and that's why we call them constant altitude slices. Looking at the 3D view, we can see three areas with higher tops. This mode provides an easy analysis mode for making deviation decisions, allowing you to look at cell heights and how much moisture is carried aloft. We start out at our current aircraft altitude of 21,000 feet. Going up, we see that most of the reflectivity is gone by 30,000 feet, and we're left with the three taller cells. The first one disappears by 34,000 feet. The second by 42,000 feet. And the third by 46,000 feet. This module will describe the modes provided by the 3D volumetric buffer. The auto mode will be discussed first. The auto mode is the automatic detection mode of the radar. Recall that the 3D buffer stores information from the nose of the aircraft out to 320 nautical miles and from the ground to 60,000 feet. In auto mode, the system compares the weather in the 3D volumetric buffer to the aircraft's vertical flight path. A variable envelope is placed around the vertical flight path. Weather that intersects the flight path envelope is called flight path weather and is shown in a solid pattern. Weather outside of the flight path is called secondary weather and is shown in a crosshatched pattern. The flight path is computed based on the ratio of vertical speed to ground speed. The expected flight path altitude is extrapolated out to 60 nautical miles. Beyond 60 nautical miles, level flight at the calculated altitude is assumed. There are two versions of the envelope that distinguish between flight path and secondary weather. We'll explain both at the same time because there is only one difference. The nominal envelope around the flight path for both versions is plus or minus 4,000 feet. Looking at the upper boundary first, it never goes below 10,000 feet. During takeoff, initial climb, and approach and landing, this gives about 10 minutes look ahead and shows weather that may be above you. So when the path is above 6,000 feet, the upper boundary will always be 4,000 feet higher. The lower boundary is different between the two versions. Again, the nominal value for the lower envelope is minus 4,000 feet. In the original version, when the flight path reached 29,000 feet, the lower boundary was 4,000 feet lower, or 25,000 feet, and it stopped there and never went any higher. Any weather from 25,000 feet up to 4,000 feet above the flight path was shown as flight path weather in a solid pattern. Anything outside of the envelope was secondary weather and shown in a hashed pattern. Ice crystals at high altitudes are not as reflective to the radar, so the 25,000 foot lower boundary was selected to show the lower, more reflective part of the cell, making the weather hazard more apparent and providing overflight protection. In most areas of the world, that worked perfectly well, but in areas with high stratus around 25,000 feet, your display could be filled with returns or if the stratus layer was slightly below 25,000 feet, you might see a ring or halo around the aircraft of secondary weather and flight path weather further away where the expanding beam width intersects the stratus. One method for dealing with this is to go into manual mode and select an altitude slice 4 to 5,000 feet below the aircraft altitude but above the stratus layer. The newer version introduces a feature called convective weather discrimination, or CWD. In the absence of convective weather, the bottom of the envelope will remain 4,000 feet below the flight path. 
so the envelope will be plus or minus 4,000 feet around the flight path all the way up to your final cruise altitude. However, if an area of convective weather is detected, the envelope's lower boundary is extended down to 25,000 feet in that area. Convective weather discrimination shows the areas of higher reflectivity while reducing the effects caused by high altitude stratus. Most inadvertent turbulence encounters, especially at night, are due to less reflective frozen storm tops. The RDR-4000 system does several things to make these cells more visible. First, in the collection process, the gain is increased when scanning at higher altitudes. Second, the floor of the flight path envelope never goes above 25,000 feet for convective weather. And third, what is displayed is the maximum reflectivity at any point from the lower envelope boundary to 4,000 feet above the aircraft's altitude. This concept is very similar to the National Weather Service images. They provide two types of reflectivity data called base and composite reflectivity. The image shown is a base image. Think of this image as showing the rainfall at the surface. On a base scan, the system uses a single tilt angle and shows the base reflectivity data. What is shown here is a single base scan on a column of weather outlined in blue that would result in green being displayed. A composite image is collected over many sweeps. In the next scan, the reflectivity is increased and would be yellow. In the next scan, the reflectivity is increased further and is red. In a composite image, the maximum reflectivity in the entire column is shown. So in the left column, the maximum reflectivity is yellow. In the center, it is red, and on the right, green. This is the result of a composite image for the same area. Looking at the images side by side, the composite image shows more returns as expected. Base reflectivity is useful for showing where it is raining on the ground. But since airplanes don't fly at ground level, it is more useful to see what is happening at higher altitudes. This image illustrates why this is so important. The solid lines in this cross-section represent isoecho contours, or lines of constant reflectivity. At the top of the cell, the reflectivity is only about 20 dBz and would normally be shown as light green on the display. Notice the arrows in the picture. They represent the wind speed and direction within the cell. At the bottom, there is inflow into the cell, but look at the top of the cell. The arrows near the top of the cell are the longest, indicating they have the strongest updraft velocities, but would only appear as light green on the display based on the 20 dBz contour line. This is what it would look like on a legacy radar system. Close to the cell, the beam is very narrow, and intersects the cell at high altitude where the frozen particles are less reflective. Even though this cell had enough energy to lift moisture over 37,000 feet into the atmosphere, it would only show up as light green on the display. At cruise altitudes with a convective cell, for any given point on the display, the RDR-4000 looks into the buffer from 25,000 feet to 4,000 feet above the aircraft altitude and extracts the maximum reflectivity for each point on the display. So in the case of this cell, instead of just showing light green on the display, the RDR-4000 would show green, yellow, and red, alerting the pilot of the hazardous condition. The area above 25,000 feet is shown in solid colors as flight path weather, and the same thing happens for the secondary weather. The maximum reflectivity of the secondary weather is shown, but in a hash pattern. Flight path weather always has priority over and covers secondary weather. So if there is hash red below and solid green above, the red will be covered by the solid green. Because the pilot will see more weather presented in a composite image compared to conventional radar, there may be times when it appears the system is oversensitive. It's not but it's one of the differences you need to understand. The key is to always think about altitude first and then color. What the system is telling the pilot is this cell had enough energy to push moisture over 25,000 feet into the atmosphere. The solid flight path color doesn't necessarily mean that you will need to avoid this weather. It means the weather has penetrated your protection zone, should be monitored, and may require analysis. 
and for the same reason, it might appear at times that the system isn't sensitive enough. In this case, the height of the cell has been decreased, so the pilot only sees green above 25,000 feet. But remember, the flight path weather always has priority over and covers secondary weather. So the flight path weather, which is green, covers the yellow and red at the lower altitude. But again, use the key. Think about altitude first, then color. The system is telling the pilot, this cell has moisture above 25,000 feet, has entered your protection zone, and should be monitored. So how do you make your deviation decision? In just a moment, we'll discuss man mode, and later show you some practical examples how it can be used in conjunction with auto mode to make effective deviation decisions. Now let's look at the manual analysis mode. It's called man mode on Boeing aircraft. This mode allows selection of horizontal slices from the buffer that are corrected for the Earth's curvature so they are true MSL altitudes. The captain and first officer can have different altitude slices selected. The initial slice will be at the current aircraft altitude and then can be dialed up or down from 0 to 60,000 feet in 1,000 foot increments. The selected altitude is maintained regardless of whether the aircraft is climbing or descending. No weather is shown below ground level because, well, there isn't any weather below ground level. In these pictures, the same area of weather is displayed, but different altitude slices have been selected. On the left, a slice is taken at 14,000 feet, and on the right, a slice is taken at 27,000 feet. This mode allows the pilot to easily measure the tops of cells to find a deviation path while never having to manipulate tilt or perform mental math. We'll look at some tougher scenarios in just a moment, but remember, it's important to look at how much reflectivity is carried aloft, and that is what this mode is designed to do. The RDR-4000 provides an extended ground map mode. With a conventional pencil beam antenna, the radar would display just a narrow swath of ground returns. The RDR-4000 pieces all these narrow swaths together in the buffer to give you an extended ground map. The ground map is optimized for longer ranges, and weather returns are suppressed. However, over areas with very low reflectivity, like water, some weather returns may appear. Map mode is useful for identifying prominent features like coastlines and lakes. The ground returns are actual radar reflectivity and not from the internal terrain database. This provides an independent verification of position. Ground map mode can also be used to identify areas of attenuation. The two pictures shown are from the same area. The picture on the left shows weather with the ground returns suppressed. The picture on the right shows a ground map with the weather returns suppressed. Notice the areas where the ground returns cannot be seen, indicating attenuation or radar shadowing. The weather here is strong enough the radar beam cannot penetrate any further so the storm might be worse than it looks or it may extend further than it appears. The optional REACT feature will automatically identify areas of attenuation, so it is not necessary to switch back and forth between map mode with this feature installed. The hazard feature modules will discuss how to identify your installed features. This module describes the predictive wind shear function. Predictive wind shear detection is an automatic feature of the radar. Wind shear is a generic term defined as a change in wind speed and direction. However, we care about a specific type of wind shear called a microburst, where the wind speed and direction changes dramatically over the distance of a typical runway. A microburst is a vertical cylindrical shaft of rain-cooled air in the upper atmosphere. This cooler, denser air is heavier than the underlying warm air. This denser state causes the shaft air to plunge from storm top altitudes downward towards the ground at significant velocities. Upon encountering the ground, the air mass mushrooms radially outward in a horizontal direction. An aircraft on approach for landing would first encounter increasing headwinds, which creates additional lift causing the aircraft to go above the glide slope. The pilot's natural tendency would be to reduce power and or pitch attitude to re-establish the glide slope. As the aircraft encounters the downflow in the center of the microburst, the descent rate increases dramatically. As the aircraft passes through the downdraft to the tailwind portion, the aircraft experiences additional loss of lift due to the decreased airspeed. 
All of this occurs when the aircraft is low and slow with a lot of drag. Predictive wind shear is not an accurate name because the system isn't predicting anything. It uses Doppler radar to measure the speed of the raindrops ahead of the aircraft. The raindrops coming toward the aircraft appear faster, and those moving away appear slower. This fast to slow profile over the length of a typical runway is called a wind shear signature and is what the radar detects to provide alerts. Predictive wind shear detection detects the presence of wind shears up to 5 nautical miles ahead of the aircraft, giving 10 to 60 seconds advance warning. It is automatically turned on when in the air below 1800 feet AGL, on the ground based on trigger conditions that depend on the installation and may be one or more of the following. Typically, engine at takeoff thrust setting, or both at oil pressure active and transponder on, or RAS Smart Runway indicates on runway. At 1800 feet, the system will start scanning for wind shears so that it can provide advisory alerts at 1500 feet and cautions and warnings at 1200 feet AGL. The system can provide three types of alerts, advisory, caution, and warning. Alerts are based on wind shear location, not strength. Once the event meets the threshold, an alert will be generated. The type of alert is based on the proximity to the aircraft. When a wind shear is encountered less than 1500 feet AGL, the appropriate alert is issued and the icon appears on the display. At installation, advisory alerts may be suppressed. Advisory alerts are provided in the region plus or minus 40 degrees from aircraft track and 0.5 to 5 nautical miles in front of the aircraft. Between 50 feet and 1500 feet AGL, the system will indicate an advisory alert by icon only if enabled. New alerts are inhibited below 50 feet AGL if airspeed is greater than 100 knots on takeoff and airspeed is greater than 60 knots on approach. The inhibit regions are typically defined for specific conditions of altitude and airspeed where it would be more dangerous to abort the takeoff or landing. Caution alerts are provided in the region plus or minus 25 degrees from aircraft track and from 0.5 to 3 nautical miles in front of the aircraft. Between 50 feet and 1200 feet AGL, the system will indicate a caution alert with visual, oral, and icon enunciations. New alerts are inhibited below 50 feet AGL if airspeed is greater than 100 knots on takeoff and airspeed is greater than 60 knots on approach. On approach, new caution alerts may be inhibited as high as 400 feet AGL. Warning alerts are provided in the region plus or minus 0.25 nautical miles from aircraft track and 0.5 to 1.5 nautical miles in front of the aircraft, 3 nautical miles if on the ground. Note that on approach below 370 feet AGL, the alert range is gradually decreased to avoid alerting for events that are past the far end of the runway. Between 50 feet and 1200 feet AGL, the system will indicate a warning alert with visual, oral, and icon enunciations. New alerts are inhibited below 50 feet AGL if airspeed is greater than 100 knots on takeoff and airspeed is greater than 60 knots on approach. The difference in altitudes and airspeeds are due to the two different configurations available to installation, configuration A and configuration B. Configuration B is what is typically used for Boeing production aircraft, but always verify what your aircraft uses. The main differences are that Configuration B does not provide advisory alerts, which are alerts using the icon only. On takeoff for Configuration A, new alerts are inhibited when the airspeed is greater than 100 knots if radio altitude is less than 50 feet AGL. That is also true for warnings in Configuration B, but new caution alerts are inhibited when airspeed is greater than 80 knots if radio altitude is less than 400 feet AGL. Likewise, on approach for configuration A, new alerts are inhibited when the airspeed is greater than 60 knots if radio altitude is less than 50 feet AGL. That is also true for warnings in configuration B, but new caution alerts are inhibited when airspeed is greater than 60 knots if radio altitude is less than 400 feet AGL. The wind shear icon shown on the display represents the location of the event in both range and azimuth. 
This wind shear event begins about 2 nautical miles ahead and 25 degrees to the right of the aircraft. The yellow and black search lines, or flashlight beams, help locate the icon when a higher display range is selected, which would make the icon very small and hard to see. This module will discuss the optional hazard display features. The RDR 4000 standard features include a three-dimensional volumetric memory where all weather information is automatically collected, stored, continuously updated, motion compensated, and corrected for the Earth's curvature. The use of a topography database resulting in a significant reduction in ground returns, an auto mode differentiating weather in and out of the aircraft's flight path, an analysis mode allowing horizontal slices through the weather in 1,000 foot increments from the ground level to 60,000 feet, an extended ground map mode for identification of terrain features, automatic forward looking wind shear detection, and enhanced turbulence detection to 40 nautical miles. In addition to the standard features, there are optional hazard display features available as individual subscriptions or as a hazard package bundle. The hazard package bundle was previously referred to as the hazard version 2 features and included predictive hail and lightning, react, and extended range turbulence to 60 nautical miles. We'll go through each of the features shown and also how to determine which features are installed on your aircraft. Many of the new features are made possible because of the unique 3D volumetric buffer of the RDR 4000, which provides a complete picture of the weather ahead. The scanned information stored in the 3D volumetric buffer provides a database of live storm cell information that can be analyzed to provide information on measured and predicted hazards to the crew. Enhanced turbulence detection to 40 nautical miles is included in the standard RDR 4000 system. It is a direct Doppler measurement and provides greater sensitivity, fewer false alerts, and improved correlation to predicted G-forces on the aircraft compared to traditional turbulence detection. Magenta turbulence indications are provided out to 40 nautical miles for any range selection and indicate moderate and higher levels of turbulence. In auto mode, they are displayed when within the flight path envelope and in the manual analysis mode for the selected altitude slice. Because of the increased sensitivity of the RDR 4000 system, we can provide extended range turbulence out to 60 nautical miles for all range selections. It is also a direct Doppler measurement and displayed in the same manner as the enhanced turbulence indications indicating moderate and higher levels of turbulence. Both the enhanced to 40 nautical miles and extended to 60 nautical mile turbulence indications are displayed as solid magenta blocks helping to visually differentiate them from reflectivity data. In auto mode, they are displayed when within the flight path envelope and in the manual analysis mode for the selected altitude slice. Two-level turbulence takes the enhanced to 40 nautical miles or extended to 60 nautical mile turbulence data and discriminates between severe and moderate levels of turbulence. Severe turbulence is indicated on the display with solid magenta areas while more moderate turbulence within 40 nautical miles or 60 nautical miles of the aircraft is depicted with cross-hatched square areas. It is displayed in the same manner. In auto mode, they are displayed when within the flight path envelope and in the manual analysis mode for the selected altitude slice. The final turbulence feature is long-range turbulence, which displays turbulence beyond 40 nautical miles or beyond 60 nautical miles if extended turbulence is installed out to 120 nautical miles. At these ranges, the presence of turbulence conditions is inferred by analysis of the data in the 3D memory. These areas are indicated with solid magenta blocks and represent severe turbulence. It is displayed in the same manner. In auto mode, they are displayed when within the flight path envelope and in the manual analysis mode for the selected altitude slice. Two-level turbulence and long-range turbulence are only available as a subscription. The three types of turbulence information are blended together in range for a seamless presentation. The blending range always begins at 30 nautical miles and extends to either 40 nautical miles for enhanced turbulence or 60 nautical miles for extended turbulence. Beyond 40 or 60 nautical miles, all turbulence information is inferred. All three of the enhanced turbulence features are available as a subscription. 
and the enhanced 60 nautical mile turbulence is included in the hazard feature bundle with the REACT and predictive hail and lightning features. REACT, or Rain Echo Attenuation Compensation Technique, provides for the detection and display of severe attenuation, or radar shadowing. As the transmitted radar signal travels through heavy rain, it loses power or becomes attenuated. If this attenuation is severe enough, weather behind a storm cell may not be detectable, or it may be displayed as being less severe than it actually is, for example, green instead of yellow. This feature automatically indicates areas where the radar signal has been attenuated. These areas are shown as magenta arcs superimposed over the reflectivity in the areas where the signal attenuation is significant. These arcs indicate that there could be severe weather in that area, even though only mild or no reflectivity is shown. In areas where the REACT field is shown, expect the possibility of weather that may need to be avoided. The geometry between the aircraft and the attenuating weather may change as the flight progresses. This may allow weather that was in the REACT area to later be outside of the REACT field, and the radar will then more clearly display weather in that area. In the picture on the left, a line of very strong cells has attenuated the signal to the point the radar beam cannot penetrate any further. So the storm might be worse than it looks or may extend farther than it appears. In the picture on the right, there are areas just to the left of center that although attenuated at longer range represent a true picture of the weather up to the magenta arcs. By looking at vertical columns of the weather throughout the 3D buffer, we can find areas of convection then applying additional information, such as altitude and intensity of reflectivity, we can predict areas that are likely to produce hail and or lightning. These areas are presented on display as icons, indicating the range and azimuth as shown. Hail and lightning icons are shown out to 160 nautical miles and indicate that conditions are conducive to the development of hail and or lightning. They do not guarantee that hail or lightning will be present nor does the absence of an icon guarantee that the condition will not be present. The icons indicate general areas or storm areas that are likely to produce the condition. They do not indicate precise boundaries or keep out areas and you can't be safe by just avoiding the icon. The icon indicates that this cell is likely to be worse than other cells. There will be slight differences in the icon shown due to several reasons. As you increase range, icons may need to be combined because of minimum size constraints, but the biggest difference will be between auto and manual mode and the selected altitude slice. So it's helpful to understand the hail and lightning hazard icon logic. It is based on the identification of three-dimensional hazardous convective areas, the current aircraft altitude and vertical flight path. Once a cell is determined to contain a convective hazard, either lightning or hail, the protection zone is established within the vertical column for that hazard from 4,000 feet above the highest reflectivity all the way to the ground. The reason for this is that hail falling from above is a hazard down to the ground, and lightning tends to discharge from the source to earth, although in some cases goes cloud to cloud. So the area below the cell is considered hazardous in this case as well. The recommended deviation around these cells is at least 20 nautical miles because both hail and lightning hazards may not discharge directly below the cell. In auto mode, the radar determines where the vertical flight path, current aircraft altitude, plus any climb or descent profile, passes through a convective hazard zone. In manual mode, the selected reference altitude is used to determine the regions where it passes through these hazardous protection zones which extend down to the ground. Given the logic between auto and manual mode and the fact that the hazardous zones extend all the way to the ground, you will see the same icons when using manual mode and selecting a reference altitude below the current vertical flight path. In this image, the aircraft is at 30,000 feet and an altitude slice is taken below the aircraft at 5,000 feet, so the icons look the same. The manual mode icons may appear different when selecting a reference altitude above the current flight path where the selected altitude is more than 4,000 feet above the highest reflectivity. This is the reason you can see an icon in manual mode with no associated reflectivity. 
In this image, the aircraft is at 30,000 feet and an altitude slice is taken at 39,000 feet. So some icons have been removed, especially in areas not showing reflectivity. Also note that a hail icon may be downgraded to a lightning icon when looking at manual altitudes above the auto mode flight path. The hazard display provides significantly more information to the flight crew on the severity and probability of weather threats. Standard reflectivity is shown by colors and is calibrated to rainfall rate according to FAA requirements, providing a probability of the weather having convective turbulence. Red weather is possibly severe, and magenta is definitely severe as it's a direct measurement of turbulence. Areas having attenuation are shown with magenta arcs. Lightning and hail are also directly related to threat level as the vertical growth and profile are analyzed to determine if the cell is dangerous. These new capabilities provide greater situational awareness to the crew and enables them to avoid areas where there is a high likelihood of lightning, strike, or hail encounter. The cell tracking and trending feature monitors convective areas out to 240 nautical miles ahead of the aircraft. The system measures the centroids of detected convective weather cells or areas of predicted hail or lightning. It tracks the cells, keeping a history of the speed, heading, growth, and decay. Understanding this weather movement can help in early planning of deviations to minimize fuel burn. Cell tracks will be displayed on top of reflectivity. These tracks indicate the predicted direction of movement of weather cells with moderate or severe convective activity. The cell track is depicted by a magenta vector. The cell track vector starts at the centroid of the weather cell or hazard area, hail or lightning, being tracked. The endpoint of the cell track vector indicates the predicted centroid position in 30 minutes. If the cell tracking and trending feature of the radar system is enabled, cell growth icons will also be displayed on top of reflectivity to identify areas with increasing convective activity. The radar system predicts cell growth by analyzing the vertical columns of the convective cell in the 3D memory. The cell growth icon is depicted by an amber plus shaped symbol with a magenta border. Cell track vectors and cell growth icons are displayed up to a range of 240 nautical miles. Note that hail and lightning icons are only displayed out to 160 nautical miles, but their associated tracks may extend out to 240 nautical miles. If the track convective cell coincides with the location of any hazard area, hail or lightning, the cell growth icon will not be shown. Cell growth icons have the lowest priority among hazard symbology. That is, hail icons have the highest priority, followed by lightning icons, and finally cell growth icons if they happen to occur at the same spatial location. Avoid areas with cell growth icons, as areas with growing convective activity may develop into severe convective activity with conditions conducive to the development of hail or lightning. Also avoid the endpoint of the cell track vector by 20 nautical miles. In some installations, the connected radar feature can send radar data to a ground installation using ACARS or other communication systems. This is transparent to the pilot. At times, while performing analysis, it may be desirable to view the underlying reflectivity levels by suppressing the display of turbulence, hail icons, lightning icons, cell track vectors, and cell growth icons if installed. If you want to view reflectivity information while in auto or man mode, rotate the gain knob out of the cow position and then back to cow to suppress the hazard icons and turbulence indications for approximately 30 seconds. If you're using the gain knob to go to variable gain, the hazard icons and turbulence indications will be suppressed for about 30 seconds after the last adjustment of the gain knob. If you are using variable gain and the icons appear after the 30 second timeout, simply turn the gain knob to cal and then back to the desired gain setting. If you switch to the auto or man mode while using a variable gain setting, the hazard icons and turbulence indications will be suppressed for approximately the first 30 seconds after entry into the new mode and then restored. Note that this does not affect the display of react and predictive wind shear icons. 
Also, please remember to return the gain control back to the calibrated position after you have completed your analysis. We'll finish up this section by looking at the test mode to see how you can determine which features are installed and active on your aircraft. To perform a system test on the ground, select weather on at least one display. You can use any range selection, set calibrated gain, then select test mode. The system will perform a built-in test. Verify the predictive wind shear fail in-op lamp in the cockpit along with the visual and oral alerts shown. This image shows predictive wind shear enabled and enhanced turbulence to 40 nautical miles. Verify that the green, yellow, red, and magenta bands are present. If other operational features are installed, they can be identified on the display. These include predictive hail and lightning, react attenuation detection, extended range turbulence, two-level turbulence, long range turbulence, cell tracking and trending, and connected radar. Any expired features will not be shown on the test pattern. After the test bands are removed, any faults, if present, will be shown. Following faults, any disabled or expired features will be displayed, followed by enabled features. If there are no system faults, Radar OK will appear next. And the sequence will complete by displaying pages showing names, part numbers, configuration information, etc. Now let's look at some real life operational examples. Recall that all radars are subject to line of sight limitations. The red area in this picture shows where the radar's energy is blocked beyond the horizon due to the Earth's curvature. The radar line of sight, or radar horizon, varies with altitude and is approximately 200 nautical miles at 26,000 feet and 250 nautical miles at 41,000 feet. Even though the radar energy is blocked, we can use this to our advantage. Anything that shows up beyond the radar line of sight is significant and should be monitored. But at this distance, deviation decisions are not being made. The weather at this range should be viewed on a more strategic basis. By the time the aircraft reaches these cells, they may have moved into or out of the flight path, increased or decreased in intensity, or completely dissipated. At long distances, all the pilot knows is they are worth monitoring. At long ranges, the beam is extremely large, so everything will be shown as flight path weather since there is an adequate resolution to separate it into flight path and secondary. But again, this should not be an issue because at this distance, the weather should only be considered strategically. As the weather gets closer, it will separate into flight path and secondary weather and provide adequate resolution for analysis. So let's look at a couple of examples using the analysis capabilities of the radar. In this example, the Honeywell 757 is level at flight level 400 over Louisiana. There are some cells with low tops and low reflectivity near the aircraft which are non-threatening. 120 miles ahead, there is some yellow reflectivity that warrants attention. The auto mode display is on the left, and on the right side, a constant altitude slice is being displayed at the aircraft's flight level. In this particular scenario, the fact that there is not much difference between the two displays beyond 80 miles doesn't necessarily mean all this weather is at flight level 400. It just indicates that given the resolution at this range, this is the weather that can be separated from the ground clutter. As the aircraft gets closer to the weather, the radar detects what looks like a patch of stratiform weather to the left. On the right-hand display, a constant altitude slice at the aircraft's flight level indicates there is little reflectivity aloft in that area 
that would indicate a potential hazard. Remember, in auto mode, the maximum reflectivity from 25,000 feet to 44,000 feet is being displayed. The constant altitude slice is showing the reflectivity at 40,000 feet. The convective area ahead is showing two distinct cells. The apparent increase in reflectivity from the previous slide is caused by two factors. One, the radar is now able to distinguish the difference between weather reflectivity and ground clutter as the aircraft gets closer to the weather. And two, the radar can now resolve relatively small pockets of higher reflectivity because the beam width resolution is improving. At this point, the crew should expect the two cells ahead will require some type of avoidance maneuver. All other displayed weather is of no consequence. The range is now 80 nautical miles, as the cells to be avoided are at about 70 miles. A look at an altitude slice on the right-hand display indicates the cell on the right appears to be carrying a little more reflectivity aloft than the cell on the left. The auto mode display is showing a patch of yellow reflectivity immediately to the left of the two cells. But analysis using constant altitude slices indicates the bulk of the reflectivity from this feature is not seen until about flight level 300, which reduces the threat level somewhat. Given the wind direction of right to left, the pilot should be planning a deviation to the right side of the two cells, which makes any reflectivity to the left of no interest. However, there is some weather to the right coming into view near the deviation path that will need to be monitored. 20 miles closer, the cell on the right is showing much more reflectivity, and a look at an altitude slice shows it is the only cell that is a hazard at the aircraft's flight level. The weather to the right of the two cells in the deviation path has developed into nothing of interest. When the cell is at a range where turbulence can be measured, additional evidence comes into view, the magenta color, indicating the cell on the right is the most important one to be avoided. A constant altitude slice at flight level 350 shows a clear corridor on the right-hand display for deviation around the weather. Here is another example to illustrate how the auto and man modes are used to analyze and avoid convective weather. It will emphasize the use of constant altitude slices to analyze a line of convection in order to find an avoidance path. The aircraft is at flight level 370 over Texas. On the 320 nautical mile range scale, there are two parallel lines of convective weather. The line at longer range looks rather impassable, but because the example is an actual test flight, the 757 crew will use auto and man mode to find a suitable path through the closer line. The 320 nautical mile display gives the big picture situation. The 160 nautical mile display gives more detail on the closer line of storms the crew will analyze to find a deviation path. The auto mode picture by itself doesn't seem to provide much hope, but looking at an altitude slice at flight level 370, there are two small, higher reflectivity cells on each side of the aircraft's track. Looking a little higher with a constant altitude slice at flight level 400, there appears to be a potential way through. These cells are still more than 120 miles away, so there remains considerable ambiguity regarding the precise echo top of any part of the weather. But so far, the analysis shows a weak part of the line directly ahead of the aircraft. The line is now just outside 80 miles, and the 757 has climbed to flight level 420. Again, the auto mode alone might be interpreted to indicate there is no path through. Looking at an altitude slice at flight level 400, the analysis shows that most of the action is to the right of track and the potential path through is persisting. The cells in the example are now at 60 nautical miles and looking at an altitude slice at flight level 330, there appears to be a low reflectivity path for the aircraft to go through. In this particular scenario, it probably would have been easier and safer just to go around this line to the right, but it provided a useful example demonstrating how to effectively use analysis to determine a deviation path. Now we'll look at some in-service experience that will help us understand how to use the system more effectively. In the operational examples just shown, the left-hand display was in auto mode, while the right-hand display was looking at altitude slices. 
The convective weather discrimination feature provides an improved auto mode which separates convective cells from stratus inside of 100 nautical miles while still showing the true intensity of convective cells. So manual mode is no longer needed to evaluate stratus conditions. However, manual mode is still useful to determine cell tops and other details for weather analysis. Without the convective weather discrimination feature, high altitude stratus weather below the aircraft may appear as flight path weather where the expanding beam intersects the stratus layer. The range where this happens varies based on the aircraft altitude and the altitude and reflectivity characteristics of the stratus layer. Without the convective weather discrimination feature, if stratus is suspected, leave one side in auto mode and put the other side in man mode with an altitude setting approximately four to 5,000 feet below your current altitude. In man mode, there are no flight path boundaries or 25,000 foot floor like in auto mode. However, the expanding beam intersecting the stratus layer will cause a different pattern, but the transition will be at a longer range than in auto mode. And if present in manual mode, the transition will change from no weather, black, to a solid color, red, yellow, green. But now you can easily look for embedded cells that appear separate from the stratus. Manual mode is also useful in determining cell tops and other details for weather analysis or any time you're unsure what the auto mode is showing you. Let's look at a couple of things that are often misunderstood about X-band airborne weather radar systems. These systems are designed to reflect off water droplets of sufficient size and quantity. They do not detect water vapor, clouds, fog, volcanic ash, or extremely dry hail and snow. Rain, wet hail, and wet snow are very good reflectors of radar energy. But dry hail, for example, only returns about 3% of the energy that a raindrop returns. At times, pilots may see a cloud mass and think that it should be shown on the radar display. Large, white, puffy clouds may be a developing storm cell, but they will not show on the radar until there is a sufficient size and quantity of water droplets available. Strong convective activity will usually be associated with hard, knuckled cloud tops like the ones shown. Glaciated, wispy tops without the sharply defined edges usually indicate weaker convective activity or a cell that is dying out. Somewhat less obvious, immediately after a storm cell has dissipated and little to no rain is falling, a dark cloud mass may still exist that hasn't broken up yet due to the wind. The pilot can try increasing the gain to see if the reflectivity is just below the green threshold, but there may not be enough reflectivity available. Let's look at an example that will help you evaluate cells. Looking at the cell to the left of heading at about 10 miles, the display is showing red secondary weather. The display is enunciating bar on a Boeing display, which means the gain is not in the calibrated position. So, with the gain turned up and the cell at close range, there is not even green on-path reflectivity displayed. In other words, the reflectivity in the upper part of the cell is very low. In this example, the out-the-window view shows a massive cumulus clouds that's not showing any vigorous vertical development. The radar display pictures are showing very little reflectivity, mostly secondary, with the weather at 40 miles, even with gain increased. As we get closer to the weather, it is displayed as secondary. This is consistent with weather that has reflectivity only at very low altitudes, beyond 40 to 100 miles, it's harder for the radar to resolve low-level weather from the Earth because the weather is too close to the ground. Here, the radar is able to distinguish the low-lying weather from ground and is showing some yellow reflectivity. As with the previous example, the evidence points to weak convection with very low reflectivity aloft. The secondary reflectivity in the lower part of the cell is not particularly high as can be seen in this picture where the gain is in the calibrated position and the cell is displayed as yellow secondary weather. The out-the-window view shows a small convective cell with glaciated, wispy tops lacking in the sharply defined edges that would indicate vigorous convective growth. 
So everything indicates a very weak convective cell with insufficient reflectivity to display any flight path weather. Another item related to reflectivity that pilots observed when they first started using the new system was magenta turbulence indications in black areas. The reflectivity chart in the picture illustrates that black doesn't mean it's not raining. It's just raining at a rate below the threshold the FAA set for green, which is 20 dBZ. With older radar, to detect turbulence below the green threshold, the aircraft would need to be about 3 nautical miles away from the turbulence in order to see it in black reflectivity. Because the RDR 4000 is much more sensitive, it can detect turbulence at the same reflectivity level from about 15 nautical miles away. The turbulence detection capability on this radar is much more sensitive and accurate, so learn to trust it. Here are some things that might show up on a radar which are not weather. These pictures show a typical interference pattern, usually caused by military radars. They can be from fighter aircraft, ground-based military radars, or ground-based radars like the Port of Seattle has installed which see ships in the harbor. These can appear as red, yellow, or green spokes on the display. They can look the same on the RDR-4000, or they can also look a little different because they are collected over multiple sweeps, motion compensated in the buffer, and separated into flight path and secondary returns. The interference will remain on the display until the source is gone and the motion compensation of the buffer data moves it behind the aircraft. We'll finish this section by talking about gain control and its use. The gain control is active in all modes, but most of the time the radar will be in the auto or calibrated gain position. The calibrated position is the only position where the colors represent the FAA-defined reflectivity and rainfall rates as shown in the table. The auto gain setting provides a standard reference which all radar manufacturers must follow. Immediately after turning the gain control out of the cal detent position allows the pilot to select minus 16 to plus 10 dB of gain for analysis. Rotating the gain control counterclockwise decreases gain. Rotating the gain control clockwise increases gain. The gain setting has no effect on turbulence detection or display. After using gain to assess weather, it should be returned to the cal position. Using gain is really quite simple. Looking at a model of a storm cell reveals it is not as reflective at altitudes above the freezing level, but very reflective around the freezing level and below. So the gain knob is like the volume control on a TV or stereo. If the music is loud or very reflective, then one might want to turn it down. If the music is very soft or less reflective, then one might want to turn it up. So to put it in radar terms, some uses for gain are, if the gain is reduced to minimum in auto mode, what is left are the strongest cells and turbulence. Gain doesn't affect turbulence detection, so any cells remaining, and especially those containing turbulence, should be avoided. Reducing gain in heavy stratus rain can also help to identify embedded cells by looking for radar shadows. Increased gain is useful when looking at frozen storm tops and can be used in analysis mode when measuring the tops of cells. It is not good practice to leave the gain control at maximum all the time, as may have been done with legacy radar systems. It could have unintentional results. With the RDR 4000, the pilot is going to see more weather, and that's a good thing. Whether at longer ranges, whether closer to the aircraft because of the 3D buffer and all the scans done at different tilt angles. Plus, the pilot is now looking at horizontal information and not just a single diagonal slice. Because the maximum reflectivity is always shown, increasing the gain will make all the weather appear more intense and make more weather show up as flight path as shown in the two pictures. Here is an example of unintentional results. This is more apparent on systems without the convective weather discrimination feature, but it still applies even with it. In the picture, the reflectivity above 25,000 feet is below 20 dBC, or black. So the secondary weather, green, yellow, and red, would be shown in the crosshatch pattern on the display because it isn't covered by any flight path weather. 
But if the gain is increased, so the weather above 25,000 feet is now above the green threshold, it will be shown as solid green flight path weather. But remember, the flight path weather has priority over and will cover the more reflective secondary weather below it, making the weather look less intense and having the opposite effect of what was intended. Gain is mainly used to look at reflectivity information when performing analysis. And the best mode to look at raw reflectivity information is in man mode. In man mode, you will not have the unintended effects as just described with auto mode. If there's ever any doubt the radar is working properly, there are several checks that can be done. A great way to check the system is by using the radar radome confidence check. This will verify the radar is functioning and identify any issues with the radome. It's very simple to do. At cruise altitude, select map mode and verify the radar will paint ground returns. The amount of ground returns will vary somewhat depending on altitude and the type and elevation of the train below. If ground returns aren't visible, there could be an issue somewhere in the system. In dual systems, you can also compare one side to the other. Switching between the left and right systems uses a different set of transmitter receiver and radar processor modules. Just be sure to allow enough time for the 3D buffer to fill up before you make your comparison. Within 30 seconds, the buffer should be completely filled. It may also be a display issue. If you can switch display generators or enter a versionary mode where radar is presented on another display, you can also check that. If the radar is painting returns but you're not sure about the intensity, use the gain knob and altitude slices to look where the reflectivity is in the cell. If you still believe that you are reporting an issue, pictures and or videos of the displays and outside weather images help immensely. It's helpful if the images show the aircraft's altitude, approximate position to an airport or waypoint, heading, gain setting, and mode. 